Hello, Innovation Stream friends, wherever you are in the world, I hope you and your loved ones are healthy and safe. My name is Randy Bell, and I'm the director of the Global Energy Center here at the Atlantic Council. Thank you all for joining us today for Energy Source Innovation Stream, where we highlight new energy technologies with the potential to reshape the global energy system. Today, I'm really excited to be hearing from Dr. Fadil Saadi, Director of Business Development and Operations at C0. Uh, Fadil will discuss how C0 aims to produce low cost, carbon free turquoise hydrogen from natural gas using methane pyrolysis. And for those of you who don't follow the hydrogen space closely, the hydrogen C0 produces is not turquoise color. Hydrogen has a somewhat arbitrary color coding system for how the hydrogen is produced with turquoise representing methane pyrolysis. So the hydrogen though is the same, same uh, no matter uh, the process for its production. Um, but before we get started, uh, several reminders. First, you can follow us on Twitter at AC Global Energy and use the hashtag innovation stream. Uh, second, after Dr. Saadi's presentation, you can submit questions through the Q&A function on Zoom and we'll get to as many of these as we can. I suspect there are gonna be a lot of questions today. If you're watching on another platform like YouTube, unfortunately, we cannot take your questions. So please uh, let me welcome Dr. Saadi to the Atlantic Council. Thank you, thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you so much, Randy, it's great to be here. So the uh, final, the, the interest in hydrogen has really grown dramatically over the past year or 18 months. How has that impacted C0's business? Yeah, that's a, that's a great question. Um, and, and just to give you a little bit of background, I've been, I've been in the, uh, the, the hydrogen space basically since my freshman year of college, I did my PhD on, on electrochemical uh, water splitting as well. So I'm quite familiar with the space and there's been a, a renewed interest in hydrogen that's been, it's been very exciting. Um, it's really um, a, a market shift even from 2019 um, when I first joined C0. Um, and it's it's been it's very exciting to see, I think a realization that in order to really deeply decarbonize our, our um, ecosystem, we need um, tools like hydrogen. And, and I think that realization about uh, the importance of chemical fuels, low uh, carbon chemical fuels, um, has, has been, um, you know, something that, that we've really benefited um, from as a society um, in, in terms of understanding that the challenges and the opportunities um, that that has. It's fantastic. Well, we're really looking forward to learning more about C0. So over to you for your presentation, and then we'll come back in a few minutes for Q&A. Wonderful. Um, I will be remiss as a, as a uh, PhD in material science, not to mention that hydrogen is always colorless and orderless. <laughs> so, so whatever uh, color you may hear, I assure you that the hydrogen itself uh, will not be that color. Um, but you know, as Randy mentioned, really excited to tell you a little bit more today about C0 and about the work we're doing on decarbonizing natural gas through turquoise hydrogen production. So won't spend too long on this because I think we can all agree that carbon dioxide emissions are driving climate change. You can see that through global average temperature rises. You see that with increases in the frequency of extreme weather events. C0 is located in Santa Barbara, California. So we're all too aware of the ever lengthening California fire season, which is just about to start. And in order for us to stave off the worst of the effects of climate change, we need to rapidly reduce our CO2 emissions, both domestically and of course, more importantly, globally. And for that reason, as, as Randy mentioned, hydrogen is, is received a lot of interest as a potential solution. There's a good reason for that. Hydrogen is a great energy carrier and it has the opportunity to be used in many different applications. In fact, for most applications where we use natural gas as an energy source today, you can substitute that natural gas with hydrogen. So whether that's uh, electricity generation or process heating or transportation, uh, hydrogen can be used as an energy source. And there's a robust debate going on these days about the best use cases for hydrogen and, and exactly where it should be um, used in the um, future of uh, decarbonized um, industries. But I think we can all agree 
that no matter what that is, hydrogen is going to play a critical and large role in a deeply decarbonized future. So one common misconception that we see at C0 is that CO2 is the only byproduct of hydrocarbon energy. And because uh, of that belief, then hydrocarbon, um, hydrocarbons can't play a role in a deeply decarbonized future. But that is simply a misconception. In reality, the primary product of hydrocarbon energy use is not CO2, it's actually water. In the case of natural gas, which is primarily methane, you actually produce twice as much water as you do CO2. So what we ask ourselves at C0 is, what if we could access just the hydro in the hydrocarbons? So just the energy in the hydrogen, not the energy in the carbon. When you look at the total amount of energy in natural gas, about 60% of that energy comes from the hydrogen and 40% comes from the carbon. And you look at say the uh, 2020 US energy production, you look at how much natural gas we produce, 60% of the total natural gas produced last year is about 20 quadrillion BTUs or about five times the current wind and solar production. So just an absolutely massive opportunity to generate low emission energy. And that's really what our mission is at C0. It's to provide low cost, low emission energy from natural gas. So not just work on decarbonizing existing hydrogen uh, generation, but also work on um, substituting current natural gas uses with hydrogen so that we can help decarbonize electricity, transportation, and, and, and process heat. So how do we do this? How do we access just the energy in the hydrogen and the hydrocarbon? Well, we do that in a process called methane pyrolysis. Uh, and so we take natural gas, which is primarily methane again, and we split it into hydrogen and solid carbon. Now that hydrogen can be used for all those applications that I just discussed. And then the solid carbon uh, can either be utilized or sequestered in a solid form. And we think this is only a good idea if two macro factors are true, and that those two macro factors have only been true in say the past six to seven years. The first is concern over CO2. The biggest trade-off with this technology is that you're leaving 40% of the energy behind in the form of solid carbon. And you wouldn't do that if you didn't care about your CO2 emissions. The second is access to low cost natural gas. It's much um, more economically viable to leave 40% of the energy behind if natural gas is two to $3 a million BTU than if it's say $15 a million BTU. We also think one thing that uh, sets us apart is the fact that we are 100% focused on optimizing our process for hydrogen production. And there's a couple reasons for that. The first is that the hydrogen market is a thousand, maybe even 10,000 times larger than any carbon market. And if you're serious about using this technology to really decarbonize large fractions of energy usage to, uh, today and in the future, then at scale, as you're scaling up this technology, carbon optimization isn't really going to provide you with much benefit. To give you a sense of the scales, we estimate that if you converted just 10% of existing hydrogen production, so forget any future uses of hydrogen, just existing hydrogen production, to methane pyrolysis, you'd swamp out all carbon markets outside of coal. And so that is why we at C0 are focused on producing the lowest cost, low emission hydrogen um, as the main process uh, for our methane pyrolysis technology. It's also important to note that when coupled with renewable natural gas, this technology goes from being carbon neutral to being carbon negative, where we're taking CO2 from the atmosphere and we're essentially fixing it in the form of solid carbon and sequestering it that way. And that's really exciting because it means we can also help work on reversing uh, climate change, not just reducing uh, current emissions. Now, our process at a very high level is deceptively simple. You start with a gigajoule of natural gas, which is about a million BTU. You need about 0.2 gigajoules of heat to drive your reaction. And you end up with 0.6 gigajoules of hydrogen or five kilograms of hydrogen and 15 kilograms of solid carbon. It's important to note that those 15 kilograms of solid carbon are equivalent to 55 kilograms of CO2 because CO2 is actually primarily oxygen by mass. It's only 27% carbon. So CO2 sequestration is really primarily oxygen sequestration, 
and you can think of our solid carbon as a more condensed form where we're not also sequestering the oxygen along with it. Now, we're really proud of the team that we have at C0, which is led by our uh, CTO and CEO, Professor Eric McFarland and Zach Jones. And actually the research that uh, was, was initially worked on um, uh, for C0 what began at uh, Professor Eric McFarland's lab at University of California, Santa Barbara, before uh, we brought it to C0 to commercialize it. We're up to, I believe, nine PhDs right now from institutions like MIT and the Imperial College of London, and um, you know some experts with decades of experience from places like Shell, Floor, and, and Zytel. So really excited about the team. It's actually already, even though this slide was made, I believe a few weeks ago, out of date with a couple new hires that we haven't had a chance to include here. We're also really excited about uh, the space and the capabilities that we've built out in the past year or so. So what you're seeing here is our lab in, in Santa Barbara, California, actually right downstairs from where I'm talking to you today, where we've uh, built out our capabilities in the past year so that we can actually go from ideation to rapid manufacturing and testing different components um, all in-house. Um, and that allows us to iterate quickly and, and really uh, work, work fast on optimizing our process. We're also really proud of our um, coalition of investors and partners, including Breakthrough Energy and ENI, who co-led our Series A, along with Mitsubishi Heavy and AP Ventures as well as partners like PG&E, SoCal Gas, the U.S. Department of Energy, and RPE. And in terms of time, timeline and where we are in, in process development, we're currently focused on our pilot unit, which we plan to have online at the end of next year. That pilot will produce approximately 250 kilograms of hydrogen per day. And soon thereafter, we will begin work on our first commercial unit, which will produce about 6,000 kilograms of hydrogen per day all with an eye, however, to making sure that what we're working on today can be scaled up all the way to world scale plants or plants that produce say about 270,000 kilograms of hydrogen per day or 100,000 tons per annum, recognizing that that's the traditional size of steam methane reforming. And also that if we are to um, use this technology to significantly reduce CO2 emissions globally, we'll need to build hundreds if not thousands of these world scale plants. And so just to quickly summarize, um, we see our technology here at C0 is unlocking the zero emission potential of natural gas. You can think of it as pre-combustion carbon capture uh, instead of producing a uh, gas, which you then need to compress and sequester and worry about uh, leaks. Um, we essentially remove the carbon before the combustion and then we can sequester it anywhere. It's easily transportable with conventional solids handling tools and it's again lighter than the equivalent amount of CO2. With that, I want to thank you again for having me at the Atlantic Council today and, and of course happy to answer any questions uh, that you may have. Well, thank you so much. Uh, really, really fascinating. Um, I know I have a ton of questions. Uh, again, in the audience, if you have questions, please do put them, uh, use the Q&A function. I see they're already starting to come in. Um, so my first question, um, is on the solid carbon. Um, mm -hmm. I've seen other other business models where part of the, the cost savings is utilizing the solid carbon as a product. Um, now you you uh, this model uh, just just recycles it just or doesn't recycle just puts it in the ground. Do you have any any reason for making that decision instead of thinking it as a product? Yeah. Um, so when we when we first started uh, at C zero, that was a that was a question and an optimization problem that we needed to tackle, and we decided that uh, we wanted to make sure the technology we were working on uh, could be scaled to you know relevant uh, scales in the energy landscape. And when you really start looking at how much hydrogen you would need to produce. Uh, for that and how much carbon you produce as a byproduct, we quickly realized that all existing carbon markets are, are really quite minuscule compared to those, those uh, market sizes. And so for that reason, we decided that focusing on optimizing the solid carbon instead of optimizing for low cost, uh, low emission hydrogen uh, would lead us to basically becoming more of a carbon specialty company instead of an energy company. Um, and so we, 
don't necessarily think that there won't be a use for the carbon. We're actually quite bullish in future uses for the carbon, but we don't want to underwrite to that. We want to start by focusing on producing that hydrogen. And then once we've got that nailed down, we can shift our attention and hopefully our partners' attentions to also extracting value for those carbons in new markets. We think those will be markets that don't exist today uh, in, in the solid carbon space, but we think uh, will appear in the future. Got it. Now that makes a lot of sense. That's really interesting. Um, two two more questions for you. So um, first, on a on a risk uh, potential risk to this technology from a greenhouse gas emissions standpoint, um, mm -hmm. do you worry about uh, methane leaking, uh, methane leaks across the gas, uh, the natural gas uh, ecosystem, uh, and how how do you think through that problem as it pertains to the the hydrogen that you want to market as ultimately part of the solution for uh, for climate change? Yeah, no, that's that's a great question, um, and and something that we think is going to be very important is making sure that. Um, methane leaks are, are reduced as much as possible throughout the chain of, of, of throughout the natural gas chain. Um, you know, at C0, we look at both our direct emissions as well as the life cycle emission of our technology. So we keep both in mind, focusing primarily on our direct emissions because that's of course what we can control here at C0. As you saw on our slides, we're still a relatively small startup. And so we can't also tackle natural gas emissions. Right. Um, that being said, one of the nice things about methane pyrolysis and about our process is really the ability to site it anywhere throughout the natural gas um, supply chain. So, you know, if there are concerns of say natural gas leaks throughout the supply chain, we can relocate the methane pyrolysis unit or sorry, locate the methane pyrolysis unit closer to the wellhead, probably not directly at the wellhead, but closer to the wellhead and then uh, transport uh, the hydrogen uh, through the pipelines and reduce the risk of natural gas emissions throughout the pipeline transmission system. Uh, but I think in general, we, we agree that um, you know, natural gas emissions need to be reduced. And we are quite optimistic and, and, uh, and bullish on seeing the technologies that are out there today that can help companies reduce uh, those leaks. Got it, thanks. That, yeah, I think that that's absolutely crucial. Um, to to get right if we're thinking about using natural gas as a feedstock for hydrogen, whether through uh, pyrolysis or steam methane with carbon capture. Um, one more question for me, and then I want to go go to the audience as they're actually pouring in now. Um, but you you mentioned that there's a, a large amount of heat that goes into this process. Mm -hmm. Where does that heat come from? Yeah, no, that is. I was hoping you would ask that question. Um, good, so good. Yeah, yeah, no, that's that's it's a wonderful question. Um, and so our process requires some energy to essentially split the methane into carbon and hydrogen. Um, and so that is in the form of process heat, and that can come from about three different sources. The first uh, source is natural gas. You can burn a little bit of natural gas to drive the reaction. Of course, that means that the process isn't zero emission or zero direct emission, but we estimate it would still be a 75% reduction compared to traditional steam methane reforming. The second is using some of the product hydrogen that we have to drive the reaction. You would need to use about a third of the hydrogen produced to drive this process. Of course, the main drawback there is that you're reducing the amount of hydrogen that you're producing. And then the third source is electricity. We can also, um, use electricity to drive this reaction. Um, and of course the emissions then would depend on where that electricity is coming from. Um, I also mentioned these as, as separate um, potential um, energy sources for the process heat, but you can also use the combinations of them. So mm -hmm. one thing that we think is especially interesting is um, looking at ways to integrate both renewable electricity when there's a surplus of renewable electricity to drive the process. And then when that is not available, switching to say either natural gas or hydrogen to, to drive the reaction to reduce our, our uh, CO2 emissions and also to make sure that um, those um, electricity, the electricity that we're using is as clean as possible. Right, and if you use biogas, would that effectively be carbon, uh, carbon neutral? Yeah, so if you use um, biogas um, to, to drive the reaction, then uh, mm -hmm. that would be effectively carbon neutral. Yep. If you use renewable natural gas in the actual, as the actual feedstock, then 
you go from uh, carbon neutral to probably carbon negative, obviously you need to look at yep. a life cycle analysis of that. Right, right. No, that's, re that's a really interesting possibility. Um, okay, good. We have a really good question from Stephen Green uh, who asks um, about if you could compare the timeline to commercialization uh, for, for C0's uh, method versus the, uh, the timeline for commercial commercialization of so-called blue hydrogen, which is hydrogen produced uh, from natural gas using steam methane reforming and carbon capture. Yeah, I would say one thing that we have been focused on at C0 is recognizing uh, the urgency of, of course, climate change and needing to show that this technology can be a tool in our arsenal uh, to combat climate change. So we've focused on, um, you know, getting this technology to commercialization as, you know, efficiently and, and quickly as possible. As I mentioned, our goal is to show that first pilot unit operational by the end of next year. And then hopefully a couple of years after that, uh, show our first uh, production unit operational. So we hope that by 20, you know, mid 2020s to have this technology uh, commercialized. Um, I'm not going to compare that really to, to SMR plus CCS in terms of their commercialization timelines, mostly because a lot of that technology is already um, quite, uh, like commercialized and it's a question of deployment and, and showing that it works. Um, one thing that of course we think um, sets us apart compared to traditional carbon capture and sequestration is you don't need to worry about, um, you know, CO2 sequestration, the challenges of potential leaks from uh, CO2 sequestration, especially in locations that might have active geological zones. And we, we live in California, so it's always top of mind in terms of tectonic plates shifting, you know, we can't can't really forget about that here in California. So having that solid carbon uh, not be something where you need to worry about it kind of leaking back into the atmosphere in 50 years if there was some sort of a large uh, tectonic shift uh, is, is something that we think is, is very enticing about our, our process. Got it. Thank you. Really, really helpful. Now we have a question from an anonymous attendee, and I'm going to read into it and editorialize a little bit. Uh, because I'm going to take it in a, in a direction, may, I don't know, maybe this is the direction this person intended, maybe not, but um, the, the attendee notes that um, this uh, methane paralysis could be a new outlet for natural gas. Um, and of course, the U.S. Is, is very rich in natural gas, but other places are as well. Now, how do you respond to uh, those who would say that this is just a way of extending the life of hydrocarbon companies? Um, and and uh, not the best route for uh, ultimately decarbonizing and creating a zero carbon uh, hydrogen uh, economy. Yeah, I, I would say, um, and again, my, my background, uh, PhD in, in solar water splitting. So, so I, I'm a big fan of, of renewable energy. I worked on that for many years. Um, but if we're serious about climate change and we're serious about needing to draw down CO2 emissions as quickly as possible, we need to use our existing infrastructure. And we have a massive infrastructure of natural gas, both in the United States and globally. And when you look at it from a global perspective, we simply don't have the time to rebuild all of our energy infrastructure. We need to use what we have today and we need to use it as cleanly and efficiently as possible. And so um, we see that as, as the main driver. We don't have the luxury of waiting until all of this new infrastructure is built before we start reducing our CO2 emissions. Um, we need to do that uh, today. Got it. Um, that I, I I very much agree with that sentiment. I, I have to say it, it's absolutely crucial to uh, to think of all the possible solutions. If you just look at the scale of hydrogen, the amount of hydrogen that is needed to actually create a hydrogen economy and to drive change across hard to abate sectors. Uh, you're going to need as much hydrogen as you can get from as many sources as you can get. Uh, as long as it's uh, zero or low carbon, you're really making uh, making a dent, making an impact. Um, now, the, the I think the, this goes back to the methane question, and that's going to be really where the rubber meets the road. Uh, if and again, as you say, this isn't this isn't your problem to solve. But if the problem doesn't get solved, then it becomes a real challenge. I think. So that's uh, that's something that, um, that I think is, is absolutely crucial. But I think you're 100% right on this. Um, so a, a question on cost, um, because um, you, you noted that this is low cost, but um, how does uh, paralysis uh, compare in terms of cost 
to green or blue hydrogen? Yeah, I would say um, I'll take a, I'll take those one at a time. The first one um, is is blue hydrogen or, or C methane forming plus CCS. And so when we look at the economics of our process, we do think it is a process premium compared to just steam methane reforming, but we think it's very competitive compared to steam methane reforming plus carbon capture and sequestration. So we recognize that there is that uh, cost premium compared to uh, traditional SMR, assuming no credit for uh, CO2 reductions and assuming no CO2 sequestration credits either or, or carbon sequestration credits. So, mm -hmm. so nothing like 45Q or, or, or say a carbon tax. Um, so, so we think compared to blue hydrogen, we're quite competitive. Compared to green hydrogen, one of the reasons why we think methane pyrolysis is especially interesting is that from a thermodynamic perspective, you need about seven and a half times less energy to split methane into carbon and hydrogen than you need to split water into hydrogen and oxygen. And so that 7.5x differential in energy requirements is absolutely massive in an energy and commodity space, especially when we're talking about, um, you know, producing significant amounts of hydrogen globally. Yep. And we think finding a way to make sure that as we scale up this technology, we maintain that, um, you know, benefit, that energy differential benefit will be critical for methane pyrolysis. We think if you end up needing just as much energy as electrolysis, but now you also have to buy the natural gas and worry about the upstream emissions, and then you have a solid carbon that you need to dispose of, that this technology no longer becomes economically competitive. But as long as we can stay closer to that 7.5x energy differential, then the technology um, can be quite competitive compared to green hydrogen as well. Got it. That's really, really helpful. Really, really interesting. Um, that, that thermodynamic uh, uh, point that you made, I think, is um, not well understood across much of the hydrogen space and really does need to get uh, put, um, made made much more apparent for a lot of folks who are talking about hydrogen policy right now in sitting sitting here in Washington or folks uh, in Europe who are working on this uh, on this issue. Okay, I'm going to take one final question. It's actually a part of a question from owner Aka um, and I'm going to reframe a statement that they made as a question. Um, owner Aka says methane paralysis will only be feasible in very remote locations or just next to get natural gas wells. So is that the case or uh, is it feasible? Or is it, could it be feasible anywhere? Where are the advantages and disadvantages? You talked about managing methane by moving uh, the site near a gas well, but are there other reasons to be near the gas well or would you wanna actually be closer to where the hydrogen uh, would be consumed? Yeah, again, I think it's, a, it's an optimization problem. There are many opportunities for methane pyrolysis but actually locating it right at where the customer site is, is, is one um, opportunity that we're especially interested in. A good example of that would be locating it next to say a combined cycle turbine that's looking to decarbonize their process. Uh, as I mentioned, Mitsubishi Heavy Industries is an investor of C0 and they build, of course, world scale combined cycle plants and are interested and are currently moving to demonstrating their technology uh, running on hydrogen and all uh, from you know, all the way up to 100% hydrogen in their turbines. And um, finding um, the opportunity to, to decarbonize the natural gas right before um, where the customer's uh, combined cycle is would, would be an opportunity to um, it, you leverage the existing infrastructure that's already there to just essentially strip out that carbon and then burn the hydrogen in the combined cycle. So we think there's a lot of opportunity there. We have a lot of interesting conversations with, um, you know, natural gas uh, companies that are um, transport transporting the the gas the, the sorry gas utility companies that are transporting natural gas, where they're looking at how much hydrogen they can blend into their natural gas pipelines. Uh, it's yet another area where we at C0 are, um, you know, aren't focused on as a, as a company, but where we have, uh, you know, partners and investors that do look at that and they think they can go up to say roughly 20% hydrogen in their pipelines without mm -hmm. any difficulty, but that's another area that there's quite a bit of interest in um, citing that methane pyrolysis unit at, um, at the beginning of say the uh, pipeline and then injecting the hydrogen into the pipeline. Right. 
Well, thank you. Um, Fadel, this is really great. Unfortunately, we are out of time. Um, this is a really engaging presentation. Um, I learned a whole lot and uh, I hope everyone in the audience did too. Um, please be sure to connect with Fadel on LinkedIn and follow C0 on LinkedIn as they uh, get to the pilot, pilot phase very soon. Uh, please join us for two additional upcoming events. Uh, on July 12th at 8.30 a.m. Eastern, we'll host a discussion with BP's chief economist, Spencer Dale, uh, on the 2021 Statistical Review of World Energy. Always a great conversation with Spencer. And then our next innovation stream is scheduled for August 10th at 10.30 a.m. Eastern and will feature Pure Lithium Corporation's Next Generation Battery. Uh, thank you everyone who helped put this event together today, including uh, Zainab Wurinen, Peter Gonzalez, Geronimo Gutierrez, Geronimo Gutierrez uh, da uh, David Yellen, and Olga Kokova. The presentation will be available on the Atlantic Council website, YouTube, Facebook, and Twitter. So please do share it with your colleagues. Thank you again all for joining us uh, and we will see you again soon.